You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 35. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast, and I'm the founder of theartistathlete.com. And I am so happy to be back. I've been off for the past two weeks enjoying the lovely holiday season, but it's January. Time to get back to work and time to get back to asking some people some questions and recording them and sending them out into the world to you guys. Thank you so much for all your love, support. I love seeing on Instagram people posting stories um, of where they're listening to the podcast or it's kind of surreal to like hear my voice in the background of all these stories all over the world. Um, so that's super cool. Another way that you can help promote the podcast is if you, on whatever platform you're listening on, leave a rating or a review. Well, actually do both. Leave a rating and a review. And if you super love the podcast and you haven't already, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. This podcast is funded solely through the artist athlete, my company. We don't have outside sponsorship except for people on Patreon who are like, this podcast is great. We want it to continue. If you're one of those people, you can help me out. Again, it's www.patreon.com slash the artist athlete. My guest today is probably one of the most requested people whenever I ask, like, who do you guys want to hear on the podcast? It's always Katie Breyer. Katie is a world-renowned flexibility and contortion instructor based currently in San Francisco, California. She began her training at the Dance and Circus Arts of Tampa Bay at the age of 11. Katie performed in countless shows across North America with companies including Quixotic, Circus Bella, Trapeze World, and the New Pickle Circus. For the last eight years, Katie has honed her skills as an instructor and developed a thriving and entirely unique contortion program at the Circus Center in San Francisco. In 2013, Katie established the Contortion Intensive, a one-of-a-kind intensive summer training program specifically for contortionists. Today, her highly personalized, safe, and effective techniques attract students from all over the world. Throughout her career, Katie has been passionate about teaching the art of contortion while inspiring people to push the limits of what their bodies can do. And I also want to mention, if you're a big fan of Katie Breyer's, and that's how you found this episode of the podcast, we mentioned two other people who have actually been guests on the podcast. One is contortionist Philip Tigris, who's on episode eight, and the other is Katie and my contortion coach, Serchma Bayamba, and she's on episode 23. So I interview a lot of different artists in a lot of dis different disciplines. And if contortion or flexibility is one that interests you, those two are really, really awesome. Um, and then I have one more contortionist, Inka, and she is on episode four. Yeah. So episode four, episode eight, and episode 23. Go check them out and enjoy this one. Here's my interview with Katie Breyer. So, Katie Breyer, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you tell the people at home who you are and what you do? Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. Have a sip of wine first. Mm -hmm. That's totally allowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As many sips as you need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I teach contortion and flexibility. I, until recently, was the contortion department head at Circus Center in San Francisco. Uh, I spent five years building up the program, the contortion program. There were no students at the time, and then I built it up. I don't know what I actually want to say about myself. It's oh, you'll say a lot more about yourself as yeah. I kind of ask you about yourself. Yeah. Um, but that's a cool place to start. Um, the San Francisco con uh, Circus Center in general, I feel like, is this kind of like hub in the U.S. for circus. 
and had historically great contortionists, so yeah. Serchma. Mm-hmm. Who, was she your coach? Yeah, she was my coach for a time. Okay. I had a coach before her, and then she was my last coach and probably my longest coach. Gotcha. And the way you train people now, is that based on her? Ish. <laughs> so there's okay. definitely, yeah, there's, a, there's inspiration from her, and there are definitely things that I learned from her that I carry through everything that I teach, but I really... Um, I've really developed my own style because I had coaches before her who were not good and injured me. And I realized that like that was not the way that I wanted to teach. Um, but when I started teaching at Circus Center, I kind of taught like very much so how Sergema taught me. Mm. And then over time, I realized what I what I didn't like about that teaching style and how it didn't work for me yeah. and how I could change change things and adjust things to try to make to try to help the students see the progress that I wanted them to see. In a way that, like, I felt better about it, I guess. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's, you know, like, elite, highest level contortion coach you can possibly be. Yeah. And I was like, that's not me. You know, like, I was like, I didn't start when I was six. I was not Mongolia's golden girl. So I wanted to figure out my own style that felt more authentic to who I was yeah. as a teacher. Cool. Mm-hmm. When did you start contortion? I guess when I was 11, maybe? Mm-hmm. When I was 11? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> what you're asking. I don't me. know either. <laughs> Maybe. What do you think? Do you, uh, think, about that? Do you think eleven? Okay, eleven. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw a girl. I was at a dance camp, a summer dance camp, and a girl was like, "Look what I can do!" And she rolled into a chin stand. Cool. And I was like, "Coolest thing ever," because I'd never seen anyone do anything like that. Because you know, there wasn't Instagram. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I didn't. I was just like, "Whoa!" And so I started. I, just trying to do that kind of stuff. And then I started watching Cirque du Soleil videos and teaching myself. And I was naturally pretty flexible. Like, my back was pretty good. So, and you're from Florida. I'm from, yes. Cool. From Florida. You're from Florida. You started teaching yourself in Florida. Mm-hmm. And then when I was 16, uh-huh. I moved to San Francisco to okay. start training at Circus Center. Oh, okay, yeah. Because they used to have, like, programs. Yeah. They had a whole like contortion program, right? They so they have like a like they really were like known for contortion mm-hmm. before I got there. Mm-hmm. When I got there, it wasn't quite so much, but there were still people teaching contortion. Yeah. Um and then a couple years after that is when I started working with Searchware. I'm trying not to say anything bad specifically about the person that I worked with that <laughs> but people always really want to hear about that. Like people are always like, "Oh my god, a coach injured you." But I'm like, "Uh and well, I, would, I wouldn't well, say who okay, it was. So maybe, like, yeah, let's not say who it was, but I am curious to know because I think you're online, you're like advocating best practices for coaching and contortion and mm-hmm. teaching and being like, don't just teach people this. Yeah. Did you have a teacher who just kind of like was like, yeah, sure, I can teach flexibility mm-hmm. or did they come from some kind of pedagogy? Was it? Yeah, more so that. So, okay. Yeah, so I had kind of old school teachers that mm-hmm. to do contortion, you were just supposed to be flexible. Right. And you were just supposed to do contortion. And yeah. that was kind of it. And so I was really flexible, but I wasn't strong, mm-hmm. uh, which was a big problem. But I never understood why. It was just, you're too weak, you're too weak, you're too weak. And then it was, do 200 push-ups a day. And I was like, okay. So I would. And yeah. I would do 200 push-ups a day for like months and months and months. I started to get stronger. But it's still, like, I, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I wasn't improving in the way that I was supposed to be improving. Um, I was flexible enough. But then as I started training more and building strength, I started getting tighter. And my coach was right. mad at me for it. And I, they didn't teach me how to warm up. And they didn't teach me, they didn't tell me, like, why my body was changing so much. I was just like, my body really hurts and I couldn't push through it. And then they pushed me through it, even when my it wasn't quite working for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, like, that's how I was coached at the beginning. It was just, like, push, 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 push. Mm-hmm. Like, more conditioning, more of this. Oh, it hurts. Suck it up. Like, it's yeah. supposed to hurt. And I was like, I have shooting pains up my spine. It's like, oh, well, that's just contortion. If you can't deal with it, then you're weak. Like, you're, like, a weak person, you know? So you, yeah. So then you're like, oh, I'm a weak person. <laughs> you know, like, you're like, I don't want to be a weak person. Um, but that coach was the coach that pushed me, that actually, like, physically pushed me too hard multiple times. And my back was injured for the rest of my career. Wow. But at that time, there was no one talking about safety. It was just, contortion hurts, yeah. And you were just right. like, okay, well, I guess it hurts. And so even though it really hurt, you kept pushing through. I did go to search my after that. And then she was great. And she helped me a lot. But I had like an underlying injury and I never addressed it because I was too scared that a doctor would tell me to stop doing contortion. Mm. So I never sought out any help. And then only after learning how, only after teaching for a while and focusing on 
not hurting people and like kind of breaking things down more and focusing more on conditioning, more on like flexibility and trick secondary, and then starting to team up with Jen Crane and KA Cirque Physio. Then I like started to really see the bigger picture and see like what went wrong with my body yeah, and how I could make sure that the same thing didn't happen for other people. That's so cool. Do you still feel pains or like, are you, how is your body now? Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't gone back to training. I can sometimes do stuff without pain, but I don't have the range that I used to have. Like my, my, my low back was where my injury, my injury was. Uh, and sometimes on like a good day, I can kind of do stuff and it feels okay, but it doesn't like my low back used to just bend, but you're good. Like just walking around every day. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, There's this misconception, I think in a lot of people's brains that like, if you start training contortion, you'll like be like totally messed up when you stop. Uh, okay. Okay. So when I first stopped doing contortion, yeah. I was like, holy crap, my back hurts all the time. But because I stopped like everything, like oh. I was like, I'm officially lazy now. And I like, just didn't do anything. And my <laughs> body would like hurt so bad all the time. But I think that was just like, I, I became fed up with the pain that I was putting myself through in training. Yeah. Like I was like, this is no longer worth it. Every time I went to a gig, I was like frustrated and upset. Yeah. And it was just like, like at one point I was like, this is just depressing and it's not, this isn't what it was supposed to be. You know, like it was something I loved and all of a sudden I was just forcing myself mm-hmm. to hurt my body. So I stopped and I like just stopped. Like I was like, fuck. Is there like a moment? <laughs> Did you have like one gig that you were like there? And I, had, like, I had like a few gigs. Okay. There was maybe like a year of gigging yeah. that it just got worse and worse and worse mm-hmm. to the point that I was like, why? Like what, what am I doing? And did you start teaching right after? Um, I, maybe I started teaching maybe... A year after, I took a little break of being kind of lazy. I was like 22, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. I took a little break of being kind of lazy. And then when I got pregnant with my son, I was 24, I got pregnant with my son. And then I was like, ooh, I can't be lazy anymore. Because, you know, I was like, I'm going to be a parent. (laughs) Like, I was just, you know, and then, but I'd always loved teaching. Yeah. But I just was kind of, I kind of distanced myself from circus at that point, you know. Mm -hmm. But I loved teaching and I wanted to teach. Um, But my coach, like, Sergio had always taught a circus center. She wasn't there anymore, but I was like, oh, well, my coach taught there, so I probably shouldn't be teaching there. You know, there was just something in my mind where I wasn't quite, I was like, ah, oh, maybe I shouldn't try to teach there. But I got pregnant, I was like, well, I'm just going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, like, I knew the person who was the, the executive director at the time, and they just hired me, and I started to build the program. And then I was, like, kind of given the opportunity to just like free reign like I was like I only want four people in a class like I went two hour classes with four people and like that's what I want and they gave it to me I love that about circus <laughs> yeah. center yeah it like, was the same okay. with Stra- when I yeah. was there teaching straps uh when Dan and I were there teaching straps it was like we only want four people in the class that's it yeah we didn't get two hours but yeah that's nope. pretty amazing <laughs> yeah but I was just I was like that's what I need and they were like okay <laughs> and and then of course if they were like well can we put more people I'd be like I'm pregnant <laughs> I would like play their pregnancy card like really hardcore. I was like, no, I need two hours. <laughs> need two hours, I need only four people. Um, but it was good because I it, like it just it gave me an opportunity to slowly start to figure out who I wanted to. I guess how I wanted to teach, not who I wanted to be as a teacher, but just I would I kind of structured things the way my coach did. Uh huh. Um, but I quickly realized that it didn't work for me. You know, like I was like, oh, like I, I was like, I can't. I don't want to just have people try chin stands. I don't want to just have people do over splits. I don't, you know, like there was just all these things where I was like, oh, I, this is not how I want to teach at all. Because when I started training with my coach, I was already advanced. Like when I started working with her, with even with Searchmore, like I was already at a level where I was performing consistently. Yeah. And so um, structuring a class in the same way she did didn't make sense to me. Yeah. You know, I was like, I Yeah, not- I actually hate teaching flexibility. People ask me to sometimes <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I'm like, yeah. No, I don't, I don't want to. Because if you can't do an over split, I'm like, that's a, I don't know what to do with you. Well, yeah, well, that's why, like, I actually, I love teaching. I, I love teaching flexibility. Say that. <laughs> no, but it's, it's like, if you, if you don't want to, like, focus on the foundations, like, that's a huge part of it. Like, you focus on the foundations for Ariel. Yeah, totally. And, like, that's, like, you, that's your thing and that's what you do. For me, like, I love focusing on the foundations. Like, I think it's more exciting okay it's really fun working with really talented conversionists like mm-hmm. it's fun it's just like really fun you're just yeah. like yeah do this and then they this, can do then, anything yeah and you're like cool but I, I i think it's really rewarding working with people who don't have a skill set yet and building them up to be able to get to the point where they can start doing contortion because for them it's really they're like oh my god this is like something they didn't think they could do mm-hmm. and then for me i'm like i've worked all this time to figure out how to be able to teach people to go from nothing to contortion yeah. and that's like 
that's what I worked on figuring out when I first started teaching at Surrey Center. And that's what, over the last five years, I feel like I've managed to, like, create a curriculum yeah. that really does work and that I feel really good about. Yeah. So what are some of those fundamentals of flexibility? I know you get this question on, like, Instagram where it's like, how do I get my oversplits? Like, no. <laughs> You're like, uh, no. But, like, could you, I guess I'm thinking for the audience at home, like, actionable ideas, maybe not such specific, like, stretch this every day for two minutes, but, like, what are the things when you are looking at a new student, how do you assess, like, okay, this is where we're going? Generally speaking, most people who come to me to work with me have similar issues because they end up finding me through Instagram and they understand what I teach. You know, people are like, oh, I've been trying to work on flexibility forever and it's not working. Mm. Or, oh, I've worked with different coaches and I never get better. Uh, like, so now I'm coming to you because I think you can help me get better. Like, mm-hmm. this is like the people that come to me, yeah. right, which is very nice. But, um, so it's usually like, and one of the, like the biggest things are usually strengths. Like, of course, I talk about all the time and it's not always one specific area. It's just like, generally speaking, they have some things that are very, very weak and that's the like basis of what's holding them back. Sometimes it's like actual, like fle- like the length of the muscles or whatever, you know, like actual like flexibility as people would call it. But generally speaking, it's a strength. It's like this, like these three areas are super, super weak mm-hmm. and therefore they're not able to progress. The second thing that I usually like address and look at is technique of st- the stretching. Like I, almost everyone I work with they come in, they're like, oh, yeah, I do this, this, and this. And then I'm like, okay, show me. And then I'm like, oh, God, what? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. no, no, stop. <laughs> you, know, like, you have to be like, okay, bring it back. And then we go through, like, a lot of times we'll actually go through some, like, kind of, like, active drills or, like, muscle activation things before we would even then try the stretch again. Because I'd be mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, you're, like, every piece of it is wrong. And you're not quite, you know, like, they're not thinking about things the right way. So I think, I think that's actually how I address things more is literally the way people think about the way they're training is being mm. like really, really conscious about what they're doing. Yeah. Cause people just go through the motions so often. And like, that's what, that's a lot of the reason why people don't see results. I don't think that people get injured as much just going through the motions. That's when people like push themselves too hard and they have no idea what they're doing. But it's definitely just me trying to be like, be present, be aware understand what needs to engage, why it needs to engage maybe. If it's weak, do more work on it. And that's kind of the the basis of the way I teach, I think. And even when I look at people when they come in, it's like kind of look at the strength, kind of look at the flexibility, look at the technique, and mm-hmm. then fix whatever parts are weak. And then make them start to understand, I guess, just like how to train their flexibility first and then progressing to working on tricks. And right. then, of course, if someone comes in and they're perfect <laughs> and they can just like, do this shit already, then it's just like, tricks, fun, that's fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, It's like, cool, oh, hands push ups, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. When you get someone who's like really good and it's like tricks, 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 tricks. I don't really get those people that much, mm-hmm. honestly. Like even the people who come to me, like I work with professionals, but the people who come to me who are professionals, again, they come to me for a certain reason. Mm. Like they, like Philip Tigris. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like he, like. Who's been on yeah. this podcast. Yeah, he's been on the podcast. Lovely. And he's, and he's amazing. He's like beautiful. He's been doing good tutorial for what, 40 fucking forever. years, you know? Like forever. Since he was negative. Yeah, yeah. 20 <laughs> like because Philip Tigris is 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> he came to me and I'm like, he's already really advanced. Like what could he possibly like want from me? And he came in we talked about what he wanted to do. And I was like, oh, okay. So then we did exercises specifically to address what he was wanting. And it was like, you know, upper back, like the same thing that most people want to work with me on. But yeah. it was like upper back and figuring out how to push himself deeper on his own because he always trains on his own. Yeah. And that's what we did. It's like we just did upper back and that. And that's usually what I do when people are, especially when people are more advanced and they're already at a level where then like you are performing. Right. Like it's like, what do you want from me? You know, like right. what do you want just from me? Because... Yeah, sometimes I'm like, that person's really good. Like, <laughs> like I'm like, you're already performing. Like, why do you <laughs> want to? Why do you want to coach? And then I realize, like, oh, okay, they have like they have gaps, and I fill in the gaps. And even sometimes they don't have really specific gaps. A lot of times people do want to get better upper back, and that's what they want to work with me on. But I'll usually have them like do a couple things that they can already do, and be like, do it naturally. How would you do that? And then I look and I see where the gaps are, gotcha. and what they could be doing better, and then I help them kind of fine-tune what they're doing. Sure. And then it ends up translating into everything they're doing. Because it's like if you fix something, even if it's in a chest stand, if it's like how they're doing a movement in a chest stand, it can translate over to their handstand yeah. and to like anything else. So I usually, with more advanced people, I do that. 
I kind of look and I just look for, I look for like the issues and then just like address them. And then they can just go on and keep doing what they're doing and just make adjustments to the way they're training. This podcast is brought to you by The Artist Athlete. Did you know that The Artist Athlete is more than just a podcast? It's a growing online resource for students of the aerial arts to deepen their journey to badassery by accessing techniques approved by physical therapists and master coaches in the industry. Our current spotlight is on the Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment, a practical manual for hanging upside down. This online manual is a step-by-step guide. It is complete with photos, videos, and exercises that you can implement immediately to help you gain the strength and awareness you need for an aerial practice that promotes shoulder health and longevity and good posture upright so you don't walk around like a gorilla. But don't just take my word for it. Here's circus physical therapist, Dr. Jen Crane of Cirque Physio to tell you more. The fundamentals of aerial alignment is an absolute must have for every aerialist of every level. I can't even tell you how many shoulder injuries I treat that are a direct result of rushing past the basics and attempt to get a trick too soon. In the manual, Shannon deconstructs the fundamentals, including the correct muscular engagement to safely arrive in these positions and the rationale for why it matters. Of course, in addition to all of these fabulous pearls of wisdom, the book is also ridiculously fun to read. It's been lovingly garnished with the Shannon humor we all know and love. Thanks, Jen. Cirque Physio is also featured in the book to give scientific insight into why it all works. Pick up your copy today by going to theartistathlete.com and clicking e-manuals. Listeners of the podcast can get a 10% discount by typing in the offer code podcast at checkout. Again, that's theartistathlete.com, offer code podcast. Now, back to the show. I remember asking Searchman this question, um, but it makes me think of it. What do you think is a performance level contortionist? <laughs> <That's hard. laughs> I know it is really hard. That's why I like it. The thing is, I like it. It's super specific to the person. Because in mm. my mind, kind of like one of the things that I feel like, generally speaking, is something that I consider it to be like a contortion act, is if there is a handstand in it. But that's only if you're already like like flexible enough to be considered a contortionist just by someone looking at you but then you should at least have like a handstand in your act gotcha but then i have seen acts where there isn't a handstand and the person's just beautiful and fluid and their ass is on their head the whole time and you're like yeah that's great you know so like i i definitely i've gone through different different uh kind of phases of thinking uh-huh. where i'm like they have to have a handstand like i'm like this asshole you know <laughs> like, like, um, yeah but like over time i'm like that was searchman's answer actually. oh yeah, yeah. She's like, if you're, if you don't and that might answer, be that might be where it came from amazing. you know what i mean that might yeah. have been like ingrained in my mind i mean but i think that's like it's it's, it's depending on what level you're talking about if you're talking about like yeah. high level like able to form in like the best shows they need to be able to do a contortion handstand and much much more right but just as far as like people being able to perform as contortionists i i mean i consider flexibility more than handstands mm-hmm. honestly like if someone's really flexible and fluid and they can connect their movements really well and they're a good performer and they like ideally could sit on their head or at least have like their feet flat in a chest stand and look happy about it, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> not like, right, not like it takes them 30 full seconds to get their feet down and then they're like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like not that, like comfortable, like comfortable in chest stands, comfortable moving through transitions. They, you look at them and you're like, that's a very flexible person. People in America, like the level in America is much lower than yeah. those places. And like in America, like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's fine. Don't yep. take a stand. It's okay, fine. Just look really pretty and be really flexible. But if you're talking about, like, really professional, like, if people want to be in Cirque or in, like, any German cabaret, like, I just think it really depends on them. To me, it honestly just depends on where in the market and what people's goals are. If people are like, I live in Ohio and I want a firm contortion, <laughs> okay, then you don't need to be as good as the person who's trying to be in Cirque. Right. You know? And, like, if you're flexible and you look comfortable doing things and you can... I still think you should be able to sit on your head, but at the same time, I know that was always my metric. Was like, I'm like you should be able to. Sit I don't on know your if head. you can call yourself a contortionist unless your butt goes on your head. But I also don't consider. I don't think you have to be able to sit on your head in performance. I don't think that people should be pushing themselves to their absolute maximum on stage. Like oh, I never sat on my head. Talk more about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So, so you don't think that people should push themselves to their max on, on stage. stage? 
No, yeah, I agree especially with, with contortion because like we're, like contortion, there's so much warm up, there's so much training, and you're training your flexibility all the time. Like I would always, I would sit on my head in training, but I never tried to sit on my head in performance. You know, like I wasn't pushing my body that far. Right. Maybe if my maybe if I was super warm and adrenaline was kicking that day, like maybe. But I was never trying to go to my absolute max of flexibility when I was on stage because when I was newer, I would try to do that. And it was just, it was like, you, just training your act was impossible because you're trying to push yourself to do the absolute hardest things you could possibly do that you maybe get once every five times in training. And then you're yeah. trying to put it into an act that's consistent. Yeah. So like, I, I think like, sit on your I see that with aerialists as well. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, here's the hardest thing I can do. And you, the thing is you can see it. You're like, mm-hmm. that person's having a really hard time. <laughs> and then you can in your face is like going to explode when you're like going to your <laughs> max. You know? like, or you get that weird like exorcist yeah, thing with your yeah, eyes. It's like, ah, and you're like, that is yeah. not, that really takes away from like the beauty of the face contortion. <laughs> yeah. So like, I think, I think that in your training, you should be pushing your flexibility as much as you can. And ideally sitting on your head in training would be like a goal to be able to be training or to be performing yeah. contortion. Because then, like, you're not going to go that far, but you should be that flexible. Right. So that when you're on stage and it's dialed back, like, to half, you're, like, still doing something impressive looking. <laughs> <laughs> still something people want to watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you train people at the San Francisco Circus Center right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have people online also. Mm-hmm. Do you have regular students online? No, because I don't offer that right okay. now. Like, I don't. It's not an option right now. Gotcha. Um I have people who do my online training package and then do like check-ins. So I'll see. Yeah, them. sorry, I, <laughs> I wasn't gonna bring it up. <laughs> um, I was on a train. <laughs> I know. Oh, hey, sorry, I'm on the train. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what to do. But, um, yeah. So, so I my like, uh, yeah. so I did have a question. Oh yeah, about that. <laughs> yes. which like, was on? how is that different? Or when you're coaching someone or looking at them online, obviously you can't like put your hands on them or be like, mm-hmm. here, yeah, yeah, right here, you know? Like yeah. yeah, so what do you do in those situations? It, it took me a little bit of time when I started doing online training. Like, I was mm-hmm. like, okay, how do I get people to do what I am what I would normally manually do? So when I started, right. so actually when I started teaching online, of course I hadn't quite figured it out because it was new, but I immediately realized that I was like, oh, you have to really explain things like really clearly and be able to tell people exactly what needs to be happening and have different cues that work for different people because everyone needs some different shit. So I quickly realized that, of course, and then I started to just be, I started to kind of figure out the ways that I want to describe things, showing people how they could tactile cue themselves, where they could kind of put their hands to do things, how to think of getting into a stretch to get themselves deeper, even if it wasn't having someone push on them. Mm-hmm. And it's actually been really effective. Like once I started to figure it out, I was like, okay, this like, it is actually really good. People, like people have their training plans and they work on them. And then when we do the Skype sessions, usually like they have like a few breakthroughs with like how deep they can get in things and how much more they understand the positions. Like they're already, everything's described in the training plans, but then of course just actually being able to, for me to look at them and yeah. tell them what they're doing wrong, what they're doing right how they need to change the way they're thinking about what they're doing to, like, get themselves into a better position. Did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, that answered the question great. You had to be much more, like, audible or, like, with yeah. your cueing. Yeah, because I used to, I would just push people because I'm like, I know how to get you into the position. I would just do that. And then I almost felt like that ended up, I almost used that as, like, a crutch to not have to explain things because, you know, it's easier to just push somebody <laughs> than usual. Oh, words. totally. You're just like, boom, boom, boom. You're like, go here. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, you're like, yeah. there, that's it. But I realized that I really, it made, starting to do online training actually made me, like, a way better coach because then I was like, oh, I can use words. <laughs> you know, like, I was like, wait a minute, I could just tell you something. <laughs> so I still push people in classes, you know, but I started to, I started to kind of incorporate the wording that I would use online and the way that I would explain things when I was on a Skype session in my classes and like even showing my students how to push into things more and just I was just started to be a lot more clear with my in-person students as well because I really yeah. started doing online training once I started the hang of it I was like oh my god I'm I'm more clear with what I'm doing with the people online because I was like I have to be I was like we have one session together right like I have to be really really clear so then I started to try to bring that into my group classes as well I love that. Because I, I really, I was like, people love knowing why they're doing what they're doing. But yeah. in group classes, most people won't be like, why am I doing this? <laughs> you know? And right, if, yeah, if they, yeah, If they would ask, I would tell them. But, you know, like, I would normally have the same people every week, so I wouldn't 
stop and explain everything because they were in class all the time. Yeah. But then, like, it would be six months later and someone in class would be like, so why did we do this stretch? And I'd be like, oh, my God. For six months, you haven't thought to ask why we were doing this? <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm so glad you said yeah. that, actually, because I have things like that, too, where I'm like, no, we practice externally rotating when we're upside down like this because you need it for this yeah. position. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you're like, oh my God, people, but they don't, you know, like people don't think about it. And then mm. you're like, I assume that because you're in my presence every week, you just know Throughout what I know. Is. Yeah. Right. I'm like, you know, because I know. Right. So obviously. So like, <laughs> I'm like, you don't know what I know. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> I guess I have to teach yeah. you. You're like, do you want me to explain something? <laughs> really? <laughs> like, all right. I can do that. <laughs> you alluded to this once. Um, I feel like on Instagram or somewhere I saw it and I was very like intrigued by it where you said that you had like these yoga Instagram celebrities come to you oh. <laughs> to like learn yoga. And I, I, you guys can't see it, but I'm putting yoga in air quotes <laughs> because there's this ever irritating thing I feel like that happens where people think contortion is yoga. Yeah. Or vice versa. Yeah. Less vice versa, actually. More contortion is yoga, not yoga is contortion. But no, it's both. Mm, it's definitely okay. both. I've worked with a few, like, very, very well-known yogis. Um, Can you say any on the podcast? Pro- uh, there's one who wouldn't mind, and the other two I actually asked, and they said that I shouldn't mention them. So this, okay, so this is what's interesting to me. So... Uh, there's a girl, uh, I don't actually know how to say her last name, Janice Lau. She recently came to work with me, like, we're cool. You know, like, she awesome. came to work with me. She was posting about how she was coming and training with cool. me as a contortion coach. Shout out and to it's Janice. Like to fr- yeah, it's a shout out to Janice. She's the shit. She's hilarious. Live um, it. She's new- in New Jersey, but she's, like, big yogi. She has retreats all over the world. She's super cool. But she came to me to, like, learn more about flexibility and how to, like, deepen her practice because she wanted to be able to get deeper and all that, all that, you know, all the normal stuff. Um but was very, very open about the fact that she was working with a contortion coach. You know, like, she wasn't trying to hide it. I've had two people that I worked with that asked me not to mention that they were working with me because they were kind of well-known in their circle of whatever specific yoga they do. They're, like, well-known. And they didn't want people knowing that they had gone to a contortion coach. Huh. And I was like, but that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, I was like, you want to get more flexible. So you're going to someone who can teach you that specifically. Right. But then you're saying that yoga is making you the way you are, even though you're going to other coaches. Like, they went to different hypnosis coaches, different contortionists. I like, think this all the time. I go to my yoga classes because I love yoga. I've been doing it forever. <laughs> but I'm like, there is no way that you could get to the level that some of these people are at without... By going to the yoga classes yeah, that you go to alone. every week. I mean, some, like, some people are, like, they have, I don't want to phrase this. They have, like, something, of, like, the natural, that, like, natural contortion thing. You know, mm-hmm. where, like, the people who are, like, naturally drawn towards flexibility and contortion. Yeah. So they, like, have that. And by doing yoga, they become more flexible. Right. And they become contortion level flexible because yeah. their bodies are just, like, work in that way. But for everyone else, <laughs> it, like, that is not how it works. And for the people who, who like do get to a certain point in yoga and then go to seek out contortion coaches, like I've had a lot of people, not famous yogis, like just normal yogis that come to me because they're like, I love yoga. I'm going to continue doing yoga forever. But like, I want to now push the limits of my body and like push my boundaries and figure out like what else I can do. And then they come to me and then we like do other things and we do contortion and we switch yeah. it, you know, and we like switch and go to different things. Then they continue practicing yoga and then they do it. Then they continue doing contortion. But I've had pretty much every yogi that's worked with me very seriously just be like, they're two different practices. Yoga is one thing, contortion is another thing, and they're different. And there isn't really much overlap. You know what I mean? Like, because it's not, it's not the point. So I don't like, I don't like when the well-known people pretend like they don't go to coaches. <laughs> so yeah, it seems like, like what you say is like, it's not the point. It's not the point, I, yeah. And if yeah. they're like, oh, and now look at like how much deeper I am Because the point of yoga point. is to like, be enlightened. Yeah, it's like peace, right? It's the like, point it's of contortion is to like <laughs> look cool. Look awesome. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. opposite yeah. of yeah. enlightenment. Yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah, it's the opposite. Like contortion, it's yeah. true though. Yeah. Contortion's like performative, and the point, like contortion, is meant to be seen. That mm-hmm. is the whole point. Mm-hmm. Yoga is meant to be felt, and that's the point. And of course, you can have a similar. You can like kind of think of both things and both, but 
it's just so it's just not the point at all and yeah yeah I guess I get it I just get annoyed when people clearly train with kid Russian coaches and then they continue to post on Instagram being like look at this amazing thing I can do yay I do yoga and then you're like okay but you learn that in another by other means right and it's important to let the general public who don't understand that know that they're two different things which is why I talk so heavily about it <laughs> like, that's great yeah that makes so much sense it's like just because it's different because it's different and people just don't they don't know they see something yeah. that looks kind of flexible and they either think contortion or yoga depending on who they are yeah and like understanding the distinction is important because it just depends on their goals if they're just like I just want to be comfy and move around and like be happy do yoga perfect like if you want people to see it and you want to be on stage and you want to be like presenting yourself as a piece of art you should be doing contortion. Mm-hmm. So. What do you do? <laughs> Aside from drink wine out of the box. Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's like, do you still stretch? Do you have any like practice of your own? No. <laughs> no. Uh, do I'm, you miss it? Yeah. Mm, I miss what it was before I was injured. Mm. Because it, it didn't hurt. And I could do all this cool stuff in my body. And it was, I could express myself in a very specific way. Uh, but that went away when my body was injured. And the more I trained with the injury, the tighter my back got. Because mm-hmm. my body just started fighting and fighting and fighting. I got better. Like, I, like my handstands were better. My acts were, like, technically higher level. But I was getting less and less flexible. And it was hurting so much. And so I'm like, if I were to go back, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at the beginning flexibility that I had. I would be at the end. To me, I'm like, it's just, what's the point? <laughs> you yeah. know, like, I just, I had a level, like, I had a certain degree of where I could, like, I guess there's a certain place where I could push my body to, and that was good. And then when I got injured, like, I could, I could potentially fix my injury, I guess, and, like, really work on it. It's just that would take a lot of energy and time and with my son and teaching and everything. Right. I just, like, don't have the time to devote to it. Yeah, totally. If I could fix my injury, I would love to go back to it. Like, if my back... If, like, happen. magically we could, like, snap and, yeah. like, you weren't in pain anymore. Mm-hmm. That would be... I would, like... I would love that. And I'm sure that if I literally just, like, did some PT... <laughs> like, if I... <laughs> if I literally did, like, anything to try... <laughs> it would probably... It's just that I don't have... Yes, yeah, it's, it's more than just that I don't have the, like, capacity to try to have that be a big part of my life right now. Well, and also, like, you have such a great skill set to teach. You're so naturally inclined to... I don't know, I feel like, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this, but people who are good teachers and people who are very good at doing the thing are not necessarily the same people. Yeah, they don't always overlap. Yeah, <laughs> like, right? It's not always the same. Yeah, like I, like I can teach what I teach in the way I can because of my terrible misfortune with my training. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like I had just shitty, I had just a lot of crap that I had to go through in my training that was not good. And that is why I can teach the way I teach. And that is why I care so much about people's bodies and their safety and like learning more about how to prevent the same kind of crap that happened to me. Yeah. And if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have, I would have been a naturally flexible contortionist and just been like, do it, do it. Right. (laughs) You know what I mean? Do it just now. It's fine. (laughs) Like I would be one of those, which are like the people that I'm like, don't go to that person. Don't do that. You know, because I'm like, I'm like, it's, I think that it's, I don't think you necessarily have to have been injured, obviously, to like be a good coach, but. Just kind of understanding that it could lead to, like, literally never being able to bend your back again if you don't train someone well. I had this revelation recently where I was like, you know, like, I used to think that the Russians or the Mongolians, not that they're not amazing, I I love Sergema, but... (laughs) Um, that they were like the best of the best, you know, like yeah. if you want to get good, you go to one of these people. And then yeah. you realize that like, there have been so many advances in science and medicine and people looking at the way that we train and some of what we're doing now is kind of revolutionary in a way. Yeah. Well, I, no, I, I mean, I agree though. Yeah. Cause it used to, like, even, I mean, I even talk to people now where they're like, oh, if you're going to get good, you have to go to Mongolia. And it's like, you don't, you don't. If you're at that level where you are able to train, uh, your back flexibility and your hand balancing for like four hours a day like okay 
then you can go to Mongolia and train. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> it's like the cause and effect is off, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, people exactly. are like, oh, you have to go to Mongolia to be good. It's actually like, no, you have to like be good enough to go to Mongolia to get to that next level. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's what I think, and because I, I I do have a lot of people come to me and be like, oh, well, should I go to this this other well known contortion coach and this other well known contortion coach? And I'm like, those are really high level coaches, and like eventually you should. I'm like, but you can't do a chin stand. You can't do a bridge from, like, you can't stand up and drop back into a bridge. Mm. I'm like, what's the, po- like, what is the point of going to someone that's, that they're, the thing that they're good at teaching is, like, one arms, crack pops, mouthpiece, push ups, various different, like, crazy hand balancing, doubles, contortion stuff. I'm like, what is the point of going to someone like that if you can't touch your toes? If you can't <laughs> do a chin stand, you know? Right, yeah. And so, totally. like, to me, I, I think that it's, I think it's important that people find a coach that is at, that can work with them at their level and get them to the next level. And then once they've leveled out of that coach, then they can go to the next person. And then they can like that. kind of work their way to getting to that top level coach. <laughs> but like you have to put the work in to be able to be good enough to go to those coaches. Yeah. In my opinion. Well, we are almost at time. 40 minutes. Uh, yeah. But I have one question that I always ask at the end of every interview. Mm-hmm. And the question <laughs> is... <laughs> What is your favorite color? Okay. That's not my favorite color. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like, um, What is okay. your favorite color? <laughs> I don't... Um, Isn't that a weird... I don't have one. I wish people asked that more at like cocktail parties and stuff. Like, <laughs> what is your favorite color? It's a good color? opening line. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite color? That should be the new like pickup line. Hey, babe. Hey, babe. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you could throw people off enough that they'd be like, Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're intriguing. <laughs> It's just some dumbass that has nothing better to say. Cool. <laughs> dating advice. <Yeah>. Dating <laughs> Ask people your favorite colors. Favorite. <laughs> no, my last question is, um, and I feel like for you, I want to change a little bit. Okay. My question is always, what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Wow. Right? But I want to say the beginning of your coaching career. Mm. Because I feel like I already know the advice you give to yourself at the beginning of your like, don't go to church coaches <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which is advice I got and I didn't listen to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at the beginning of your coaching career, like what you're doing now, how you're building a community of flexible artists. Okay, what I want to say, I tend to be very, I overthink everything, hmm. and I'm in general in life I'm like very easygoing, but then there are certain things I take very seriously, like teaching, I take it very seriously. So I want to be like, don't take things, t- you know, like, don't, don't be so hard on yourself if someone, like, maybe, say, isn't progressing as much as you'd like and probably that. But I think if I had given that advice and listened to it, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am now. I think the, 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 how critical I am of myself and my abilities has, is what has led me to be able to do what I'm doing now. Yeah. And so I think it's really important. You know, like, I mean, no, I'm sure that's I can, such a tricky balance, though, yeah. right? Because I'm like, what would I tell myself? I'm like, I don't know. Because I'm like, I never thought that I would be where I am right now. I literally, I started doing Instagram because I wanted to build up um, awareness of the contortion intensive that I do. That was like the only <laughs> reason I started doing Instagram. There was mm-hmm. no, there was nothing else. I was like, I just want people to come to the contortion intensive. That was it. And then it exploded. And I was like, oh shit <laughs> and then but then because it exploded i felt like it, it held that held me more accountable i was yeah. like i have to i was like i have to be as good as people think i am yeah totally. and i already want to be like i'm always like I, I already want to be good at what i do i always want to be very good at what i do but with people literally looking at you like you're a celebrity i'm like i want i want to be as good as they think i am already <laughs> and so it's it's like forced me to really like to keep growing and keep learning and and only like saying things on Instagram that I think are useful and productive, you know? Totally. So I don't know, because I, yeah, I would have never thought that <laughs> I would be like where I'm at right now. <laughs> I'd be like, don't worry, you'll kill it. <laughs> don't worry, little Katie, you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll be just fine. You'll be fine. Just keep being neurotic. <laughs> well, you are killing it. Thank you so much. For all that you do, it's super fun to watch you online. Oh, and thank you. Yeah, producing the next like generation of thinkers, thinkers, <laughs> thinkers and movers. Well, yeah, <laughs> the thinkers slash movers. Ah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's movers. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> thanks, Katie. Okay. Thanks.
That was my interview with Katie Breyer. Katie had so many great insights and great little nuggets to take away. I loved how she was very open and honest about her own experience with injury. She talked about how there was this belief, and I see this happening in Ariel as well, uh, and many circus disciplines where there's this idea that if you're in pain or if you can't handle something, that in some way makes you a quote unquote weak person. You're, and that's beyond like just like being physically strong. It indicates in some way that you are emotionally or something about your character is weak. If you can't tolerate the pain of stretching or if you can't get that extra rep in. And what that leads to sometimes is, uh, well, a lot of injury or people pushing past what they should be pushing past because they don't want to be weak or these feelings of failure because they can't at the time for whatever reason. And Katie, after her injury, spent years studying and rebuilding her contortion program to train people safely with a huge emphasis on strength, which I think people don't realize a lot about incredibly flexible, high-level contortionists, is how strong they are. I think they're some of the strongest uh, acrobats of any circus discipline, personally. Katie was also really great and very clear about the advice she gave about how technically good you have to be to be a contortionist. She talked about how in America, the technical level is a lot lower. So your ability to perform or get gigs or do shows um, will happen a lot quicker in the U.S. as a contortionist if you want to go that route. But if you want to work for some of the major companies that are based internationally, you'll have to put in a little bit more work and find some higher level coaching. Now, I love this distinction that Katie makes. She's very open and honest about this. And I think it's important to understand that you want to work with coaches who align with your goals. So if you're a beginner and you just want to get stronger or you want to work on the fundamentals, you want to have fun, you're in uh, circus arts for the community and for a cool hobby because you'll look awesome on Instagram or whatever, uh, the coaching that you're going to seek out should still be good coaching. You should still have people like Katie Breyer who know what they're doing because they've worked, they've coached, they've performed. But it may not always be necessary to go to the top contortion coaches in the world if that's all you're looking for. If you're looking to get a professional level, if you're looking to work for some of the major companies like Cirque du Soleil, then you want to do a little more research. First of all, you want to assess your physical abilities at the time. And uh, Katie talked about kind of leveling up coaching. So if you want to make that leap to being a professional, you need to be coached by professionals who have an understanding of the market that you're working in and who can be very honest with you about what they can provide you and where they can get you. If you want to find out more or train with Katie Breyer, you can go to her website. It's www.katiebreyercontortion. That's C-A-T-I-E-B-R-I-E-R contortion. Dot com. She has really cool online training plans. As you heard in the episode, I did one of them, but then kind of skipped out on my evaluation because I was traveling. And she's also on Instagram. She's at Katie Breyer Contortion. To find me online, you can go to theartistathlete.com. For training tips and inspiration, I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete on Instagram and the artist athlete on Facebook. You can also help out the podcast by going to patreon.com slash the artist athlete and becoming a Patreon today. Thanks for listening, friends, fans, and enemies. I will talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. 
Hi, I'm Katie Betts, and I am the director of Shared Culture Concepts, which is a full-service marketing company for circus and performing arts. You can visit our website at www.sharedcultureconcepts.com. On the website, you can find a copy of our ebook, which covers basics of marketing, specifically for circus educators, coaches, studio owners, and circus artists. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast, straps artist and lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye.